Hey kids, what's your family like? Do you have brothers and sisters? Maybe you have a ton of them. Or maybe you don't have any at all. Today we're gonna look at Jesus's family. Have you ever wondered who's in Jesus's family? Well, let's find out. Jesus had little brothers and maybe even sisters. You probably remember the story of how Jesus was born, right? His mom Mary was told by an angel that she was going to have a baby. And she had him before she was married to Joseph. And that baby was Jesus. After that, Mary and Joseph got married and had some more kids. That means Jesus had some little brothers and maybe even sisters. Can you imagine what it would be like to be Jesus' sibling? He was probably super nice and never got grounded. Anyway, back to the story. One day, Jesus' family came to see him at work. Jesus was teaching some people and his family showed up and wanted to see him. Now no one really knows why he was there, but maybe he was late for dinner. But what we do know is that they wanted to interrupt his teaching. So Jesus used the opportunity to teach an important lesson. Jesus taught that his real family is anyone who obeyed God. Now that might sound mean to his mom and his brothers and his sisters, but it's actually really cool. But the Bible tells us that when we trust Jesus and honor God, we become part of Jesus' family. Memory verse. Anyone who does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. There are a lot of people that honor God, so that must be a big family. And if we follow Jesus, we can be his family too. The more we obey God, the more we feel like Jesus' family. It's kind of like when you obey your parents and you get along better. When we obey God, that makes us feel closer to Him, and that makes us feel more like family. That should make us want to obey God, because being in God's family is pretty cool. So kids, next time you think about family, remember, you can be a part of God's family. Hey kids and parents, if you want to learn more about family, or honoring God, check out the links below. I wish I had something to do. <sighs> Thanks for letting me sleep in, kids. If you make a mess in the kitchen, please let me know so I can clean it up. Raising kids is so easy. I just love driving around all day. Oh, I never have to repeat myself. They always listen so carefully. Oh, look. 
An empty box of cereal. Love it. Just wipe it on your sleeve. It's pretty cold, but you don't need a coat. Oh, you don't have to push in your chair. Don't make your bed, you're just gonna sleep in it again later. I think I'll skip the coffee today. You know, these throw pillows look way better on the floor. I'm really not that busy. Well, you haven't showered in three days, but I think you smell great. We do have food at home, but let's just go out to eat. Just brush your teeth whenever you feel like it. Here, take my phone charger and go put it in your room. Oh, just leave your dirty dishes on the counter. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, let's all pull on our phones. Youth sports are so cheap. Braces are so cheap. School fees are so cheap. Hey, can you come crawl in bed with me around 2 a.m.? Thanks. Okay, I just spent two hours making dinner, but if you don't like it, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll make you something else. Don't even bother looking for that. I'm sure it's lost and gone forever. Can somebody please throw something at my head? I mean, I can keep track of every single one of your things. I get a ton of sleep. I get a ton of gratitude from my children. I get a ton of unsolicited help with the housework. Oh, you don't have to hurry up. We're gonna be right on time. Can someone please throw something at the TV? Thanks for doing the laundry, everyone. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Can you use your outside voice? Ah! Fight, fight, fight! Ah! The floor of this vehicle is so clean, I can't believe it. Oh, good. Another trip to the grocery store today. Let's go. Hey, I'm gonna hop in the shower. Does somebody wanna come use the bathroom while I'm in here? I saw an article recently in a British newspaper 20 of the worst Mother's Day cards ever printed that you should never send. And they listed three of them. Here's the first. The outside of the card read, Well, I guess this Mother's Day card is late. The inside of the card said, Looks like someone wasn't raised properly. How about this one? The outside of the card said, I'm awesome. You're welcome. The inside of the card said, To the luckiest mom ever. The third one I think was my favorite. The outside of the card has a laundry basket heaped high with dirty laundry. And beneath that, the caption said, Mom, I love you loads. Inside the card, and you might already see where this is going. Speaking of loads, can you do my laundry? Like one mother once told me, I love my kids, but some days I don't like them very much. A mom's love. Jesus even said, Greater love has no one than this, that they lay down their lives for their friends. Jesus, of course, talking about his own death and that your willingness to lay down your life is the supreme example of what love looks like. And that's exactly what moms do. They lay down their lives for the people they love. That love comes from a very deep place in them. And that same love also makes them very, very concerned for the influences that threaten the people they love. Picture this mom. She's a young mother carrying a baby and walking down a city sidewalk. She's thinking about the world that this baby is growing up in. Thinking about the threats coming from other countries, crazy dictators and forces that are actually threatening the homeland. She's thinking about religious leaders in the homeland that have shown themselves immoral, political leaders that are corrupt. She crosses the street and at that very spot, she knows that's where a young man was just killed yesterday. The violence 
is becoming a greater concern than ever. She holds that baby a little bit closer and she thinks about all the people who don't so much hate God, they just couldn't care less about God. Don't even care whether he exists. And maybe the worst thing of all, she thinks about how her own life has turned out and realizes that she is not quite the person she thought she was and she wonders what kind of mom she's going to be for this baby. That same scene could have taken place here in the USA just last night. It could have taken place in any country at any time in history. It could have taken place 600 years before Jesus in Israel, the southern kingdom, Judah, had watched the northern kingdom just spiral out of control. Idolatry and corruption and violence and eventually the northern kingdom just taken into captivity and disappeared from the face of the earth. And now Judah, the southern kingdom, is heading the same direction. No wonder that young mother is worried. What's the future going to be? And then there was this little glimmer of hope. There's a new king that has just taken the throne. His name is Josiah. Josiah is eight years old. He became king because his father was murdered. And after a long succession of really wicked kings, Josiah at age eight is surrounded by godly good counselors who understand how government should work. And Josiah listens to them and he's doing a decent job with all the help that he's getting. And then one day about 18 years later, Josiah is about 26 and he's overseeing reconstruction in the temple. And someone brings him a book that hasn't been seen for years. He blows the dust off it and opens it up and it turns out that it's the scriptures. It's a Bible. The first four books of our Bible. First five books of our Bible. And he reads it and he realizes the direction the country has been going has been all wrong. And so he institutes these sweeping reforms, gets rid of the idols that are in the temple, he fires all the priests that have been serving those false gods, brings in so many reforms, and the country begins to turn around. And about that time, a prophet appears. His name is Zephaniah. Probably not a name you'd want to give your own child, but that name means God is hidden. And Zephaniah came to talk about two things, two particular days that God was revealing to people. One he called the day of the Lord. This day when judgment would come over the whole world and that every bit of sin and wrong would be eliminated. God's fury would be poured out and judgment would fall. That was the day of the Lord, the one day Zephaniah talked a lot about. But the other day, he called the day of restoration. When those who had stayed faithful to the Lord, who had gotten through that day of judgment, who had humbled themselves and stayed faithful, the day of restoration was the day when all the wrong stuff would be gone and now these people who had trusted God all through that judgment would experience the peace and the safety that they had longed for for such a long time. Josiah grew up, he was killed in battle. Zephaniah passed off the scene and after a while, the people of Judah wound up back where they had been before. And it was because of that that they were carted off to Babylon. God brought judgment in a very small measure. 
And the people of Judah experienced that day of the Lord in a small way when they were carted off to Babylon. But that's 70 years later when the children and grandchildren of those original refugees were allowed to return to Judah. They got a tiny taste of the day of restoration. The day when they were allowed to experience peace and safety again. It was that day of restoration that Zephaniah described in these words. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. That will be that final day when Jesus returns. But for now, we get to experience a taste of that when we come to faith in Jesus and trust him and God comes to live inside. We've heard that before, that because God sent Jesus to die and take the punishment for us, that we won't have to face that judgment in that way. But sometimes we get kind of caught up in the idea that we have to earn it, we have to deserve it, we have to be good enough for God to accept us. And I think there are times when moms can fall into that trap more than most people. So many people depending on them, so much they need to do, so much they want to get accomplished, so much they want to make right And they feel like they have to perform well. And so this business of God's grace being poured out, and when you accept Jesus, you experience that grace, you're made new, and life becomes different. But too many people still cling to that idea, somehow i got to be good enough. And that's the reason that Zephaniah goes on to describe what this relationship with God is actually looks like. He says, The Lord, your God, is with you. The Lord, that's the biblical term that describes the name Yahweh, the God who is, the God who is almighty, the God who sees everything, the God who knows everything. That God, when he becomes your God, when you make him the primary relationship in your life, the Lord becoming your God, then it says, this God is with you. Because of what Jesus has done, God now just tolerates you. That's not what it says. But far too many of us believe that. The Lord God is with you. He is mighty to save. When the Lord is your God, when that relationship with him is intact, it means that he is with you. And the very best thing that you can do for your kids, for your grandkids, for the people around you, is to know this relationship And know that he is living with you and in you. And sometimes when those fears come, what if I'm not good enough? What if I mess up? What if my kids wind up getting hurt because of something stupid that I've done? Or some way that I've failed just because I'm tired or I'm weak or I lose my temper or I do something really stupid? What if my grandkids turn out badly because of me. And not only fears for the future, but regrets from the past. If only I had done that differently. If only I hadn't said that. If only I hadn't 
done that thing. If only I had done something differently. Life would sure be better. When you're facing those regrets, remember that this God who is God is with you. Listen to what he thinks of you when you're in that relationship with him. The prophet Zephaniah goes on to say, he will take great delight in you. He will take great delight in you. He doesn't just tolerate you because he has to. He delights in you. When my daughter was about four, she and her cousin about the same age went fishing with my father-in-law. Grandpa liked to use dough balls for bait. So he thought about six slices of bread should be enough to get them through whatever time they were going to be fishing. So he took these two little four-year-olds and he set up their rods and reels and put dough balls on the hooks and tossed them in and the girls sat and waited and he sat and waited with his dough ball hook. This got pretty old for these girls very quickly. So they sneaked under a picnic table and they ate all the bread that my father-in-law was going to use for bait. When he saw it, he smiled and he said, I guess we're done for the day, and took them home. Didn't get angry, didn't get frustrated, because he delighted in these girls. The Bible says that God delights in you. Something else that it says, he will quiet you with his love. Many of the women that I have known, particularly mothers I have known, are people who want to keep things right. They want things to be organized under control and they take a large part of their self-worth from keeping things going right, going smoothly, keeping them under control. And far too often, life is not that way at all. Life gets chaotic. And in the middle of that, it's hard to remember that you are a person of worth. And in those moments, God invites you to look to him and remember how very much he loves you and says he will quiet you. Even in the middle of the chaos, he will quiet you. He won't turn the chaos automatically into everything that's calm and organized. He doesn't always calm the storm. But often he will calm his child. He will quiet you with his love when you turn to him and ask. And one last thing that this verse says he will rejoice over you with singing. Do you have that picture of a grandma with a very ample lap and this two-year-old who is just squirming and fidgeting and wanting to get down and just can't stop? And grandma begins to sing. And pretty soon, this squirming, restless, fidgety two-year-old is slowing down and gets calm. And Grandma has been singing, not because she is angry at this two-year-old, but because she is so glad that this little one is there and rejoicing over her. He will rejoice over you with singing. He will bring into your life those things that remind you. He doesn't just tolerate you. He rejoices over you. He will quiet you. He delights in you. When you come to believe that Jesus' death on the cross really was for you, you. God delights in you and will quiet you 
and will rejoice over you with singing. And when you experience that firsthand, it will work through you into your kids and your grandkids and the people around you. Happy Mother's Day. Pray with me. Lord, thank you for the gift of mothers and even those who are watching this piece right now whose relationship with mom has not been a good one and their own experience of being a mother has been difficult, painful. You've promised that when we come to you trusting that what Jesus did on the cross was for us, that you will delight in us You will quiet us. You'll even rejoice because you delight so much in the people that we have become because of Jesus. And we pray it in his name. Amen.